All right, let's call this to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll, please? Council Member Taylor. Here. Council Member Engler. Here. Council Member Newman. Here. Council Member Adam. Here. And Mayor McNamee. Here. Thank you. I'd like to uh, turn this over to our city attorney, Tracy Noonan. Tracy. Thank you. We have one closed uh, session matter, conference with legal counsel for anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D4. We'll go to closed session and we'll return at six o'clock.
did this as my business first time. So that's his area. You're doing everything else. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I got you. Okay. Yeah. And then you guys can improvise when called on about the report, about the um, city okay. summit. Just <laughs> first summit. Thank everything you. else good? All good. How are you doing? We've concluded closed session. We're going to come back and uh, we have a report by our city attorney. Yes. Tracy Noonan. Thank you, Mayor Magnamy. I do have nothing to report. I have nothing to report. Excellent. Thank you. I'd like for everyone to rise for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty justice and justice for all. Thank you. Any requests for continuances by my council members? Public hearing agenda items? We're good? We have some special presentations today. First up. Recording in progress. The recording is in progress. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have a special presentation tonight from Jen Harkey. Jen, please come on down. Program Management Analyst with the County of Ventura. Jen will provide a presentation on Ventura County Continuum of Care 2022 point in time count. Welcome, Jen, please. You have to hit the button there. There you go. We're good to go. Good to Try go? Yes, you're on. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, staff. My name is Jennifer Harkey. Uh, I am here from the County Executive Office and I serve as the program director for the Ventura County Continuum of Care. Um, first off, I wanna thank council for having me here um, to present on the state of homelessness. Uh, I would also like to thank your council for stepping up. Um, ultimately, you and Thousand Oaks have done quite a bit over this past year or two uh, in regards to addressing the housing crisis and allocating resources um, for supportive housing, a new navigation center, and working to expand services in your city. So thank you. I wanna cover the point in time count data, which occurs every January, and it is a requirement of HUD at the federal level, housing and urban development, I'm going to talk a little bit about at-risk populations, our overall service system, the housing resources, and then the draft recommendations that were recommended from our Continuum of Care Board and also endorsed by our County Board of Sup Supervisors. So just a quick overview. Um, I know many of you are familiar with this, with the point in time count. So who do we count in that snapshot on the night of January 23rd. We include people who were in emergency shelters, motels paid for by programs, and transitional housing. And then on the day of January 24th, we go out and do a unsheltered count and survey of anyone who is living on the streets, in vehicles, uh, and other areas that are not meant for habitation. This gives you an idea of all of the surveys that were collected on the day of our unsheltered count across the county. Um, this takes quite an effort, um, so I do want to call attention to nearly 400 volunteers who help with the surveys on the day of the count. And I know some of you and your staff, as well as city staff and um, many organizations as well as people from the community help us every year to make sure that we are out com completing surveys geographically. We did see an increase from the prior year uh, of 9.1%, and this includes both the sheltered and the unsheltered count. I wanted to also call attention to this um, comparison of surveys versus op observations. Um, the number and percentage of those who are surveyed versus 
who are observed. Um, we've had quite a shift since pre-COVID, um, pre-pandemic till now. And so our goal in 2024 is to really um, collect as many in-person surveys as possible. That really helps us with collecting subpopulation data, um, getting to know who are our veterans, who are the youth, um, and what kind of health conditions or, or other issues are people dealing with in the unsheltered population. And this is a comparison by city. So you will see the comparison from 22 to 23. And the majority or the largest populations in the West County, although um, Simi Valley and Thousand Oaks also um, having a large population there. This is our unsheltered total. So just want to make sure that that um, that's not the overall right count between both sheltered and unsheltered. This gives you an idea between shelter counts and unsheltered counts. And I do want to call attention to the countywide number, which includes the project room key. In the prior year, we had included project room key numbers by city. And we have several people who are served countywide in those particular motel voucher programs. And this year, they were included in the countywide total. Now, we know that in the city of Thousand Oaks, we have a large number of people who are sheltered in the Premier Inn, specifically um, through the Project Room Key uh, motel vouchers still. As we are moving away from FEMA funding, we are now utilizing California Department of Social Services grant dollars um, to help people transition into permanent housing. This, uh, this is the demographics of age groups, and we are continuing to see an increase in the number of aging adults and senior populations. And this is our unsheltered. We also have uh, pretty close to where we were in 2022 as far as demographics. We have a new category here that was implemented by HUD with multiple races. So 5% um, counted there in our unsheltered this year. And then I have in bold some areas of concern um, but also areas that we, as the continuum of care, really want to focus efforts in on addressing with our new resources, more grant funding, uh, making sure that we're addressing some of these subpopulations. So some of that includes chronically homeless adults. Chronically homeless adults have uh, both a year or longer of being homeless, the length of time, and then also a disability of some sort. So that disability could be physical, mental, developmental, or substances. And chronically homeless individuals can qualify for supportive housing. And so as we're looking at um, more developments, motel conversions, um, just calling attention to your home key site that will help us convert 77 new units of permanent supportive housing here in Thousand Oaks. Also, health conditions, um, we had an increase, those with physical disabilities, those who um, self-reported also a substance use disorder. Um, that really calls attention to this need for more outreach with alcohol and drug programs, um, looking at treatment facility, um, looking at other options, and especially when we are doing street outreach um, so that we have resources to offer. We also had an increase in the number of homeless veterans. So this um, really speaks to um, leaning on our veteran-specific resources. Our Veteran Services Office, supportive services for veteran families, and Gold Coast Veterans Foundation. In the City of Thousand Oaks count, um, I do want to make sure you all are all aware we have a full count report that is posted on the COC website, the Continuum of Care website. 
So it's venturacoc.org. And if you were to go to news and announcements, you can see the full report there. And there are several subpopulation data points as well as the data points by jurisdiction. So there's more details on your city um, in that report as well. Um, but just pulling some of those numbers from the 2023 count, 61% um, of those who are unsheltered are chronically homeless. So meaning that they could meet the criteria for supportive housing placement. 25% um, are also first time homeless in the last 12 months. We've had an increase countywide in the number who are first time homeless. And this also illuminates the need for more homeless prevention funding, rental assistance, working on ways to keep, keep people housed, um, and also eviction prevention. 44% um, substance use, 17% mental health, and then 8% are fleeing domestic violence. Um, just a reminder for all of you that when we do go out and do the count, we make sure that our volunteers have resources to offer. Uh, when someone is in a crisis situation or needs a referral to services, we make sure that they have something um, to refer people to on the day of the count. And then when we look at at-risk populations, we look at our healthcare system, our county office of education, and you'll see the number here, 12,000 people served through the county office um, through the healthcare agency. And this includes a broader definition of homelessness. So it includes those who are at risk, right? So those who may be facing an eviction or living doubled up, multiple households under one roof. Um, the Ventura County Office of Education, over 7,000 students were identified as homeless, and that includes that McKinney-Vento definition of students who may be at risk or in a housing unstable situation. Um, within the Conejo Valley, I did pull that number, 248 students experiencing housing instability in our Conejo Valley District over this past year. Um, but I would say thank you to the Ventura County Office of Education and the McKinney-Vento liaisons because they offer ongoing support, transportation, referrals to shelter, and other resources. The Ventura County uh, Interface 211 call data, um, this shows an increase in the number of calls for rental assistance and also utility assistance. Um, so this really um, speaks to the homeless prevention need across our county. And then our system performance data, we have had successful housing placements, even though in the midst of a pandemic and rising rent costs, we have been able to utilize emergency housing vouchers and rapid rehousing dollars. Um, over the past year, 408 individuals have gone into permanent housing. Our housing retention, meaning once someone is housed with supportive housing or rapid rehousing dollars, um, have been able to retain housing with case management and the support through the system. The length of time people are experiencing homelessness um, seems to be um, seems to be an issue where we have people in shelters for a longer period of time, mostly because we don't have the rental units or the availability to use those vouchers. So the number of people first time homeless, I spoke to this before, uh, we are continuing to see people coming into the system or unsheltered who are continuing to need that assistance through rentals or um, security deposits. We also make referrals to the Housing Rights Center when someone's facing an eviction to help pe keep people housed. 
And then working with our workforce development partners and also employment services uh, to link people to jobs, on-the-job training. Um, workforce development programs have uh, really grown over this past couple of years. We have a program called Pathways to Employment that's working with a lot of our local homeless service providers to get people linked to jobs uh, and training, paid training. So overall, through the continuum of care, we continue to have uh, more resources coming in through rapid rehousing, and most of that is through the state funding, through what's called the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program, HAP. And that HAP funding from the state is really expanding our ability to have interim shelters, motel vouchering, rapid rehousing dollars. And you'll see this under development. Most of those supportive housing under development here um, speaks to our home key projects. And then also um, some of the uh, additional funding that's coming through housing vouchers. The number 25 there that's available, those are our VASH vouchers, Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing Vouchers. So we do have veterans who are holding vouchers and have been unable to utilize them, um, mostly because of the fair market rent limit um, to be able to use that within um, local rentals. Um, the new transitional housing projects, we have two and that would be Mesa in Ojai and also Casa Pacifica. And those two programs will serve transitional age youth, 18 to 24, and those programs are intended to be completed by the end of this year. So it will open up some additional um, transitional housing for youth. And then the new development under emergency shelter, that would be for the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, adding the new Dignity Moves project, um, which we are all thrilled to be a partner um, in this work with you on. The housing pipeline, I won't go into all the details on these, but just wanted you to have the list of all of the projects that are coming online over this next year. And these are permanent supportive housing projects specifically. So not affordable housing or not the extremely affordable. Those are also listed on our community development um, site through the county. And then our COC board recommendations. So like I mentioned earlier, our COC board brought these also to the Board of Supervisors, which endorsed um, these recommendations. Although I would say to your council that we are continuing to work with Lasar Development Consultants, and they are the group that uh, we contracted with to do a quantitative and qualitative analysis and strategic planning on addressing homelessness. And so your council also approved funding to help support that effort. So thank you for um, supporting the strategic planning as we're moving forward and addressing some of these issues. Um, so I'll just go through these um, fairly quickly. The first being um, that we want to end veteran homelessness here. We have many resources through um, supportive services for veteran families and the VASH vouchers from the VA um, that we are trying our best to utilize so that people and our veterans can get placed. The efforts to end homelessness among unsheltered youth with those new transitional housing projects coming online and also our partners with Interface Children and Family Services. Uh, we have more resources to be able to actually accomplish this in the next year. Um, reducing the number of chronically homeless individuals across the county, so all of those home key projects and those new supportive housing projects will really help us with this effort. Encouraging each jurisdiction to look at their data and really look at best practices and come alongside of the county, which you have all done. Um, so really um, applaud the work here in the city. Um, expanding the efforts with our work group 
to incorporate people with lived experience. And this has really been a wonderful experience because we're bringing in people, peer support efforts, and people who have been through it um, and can give us feedback on the programs and the policies. Reducing the number of people first time homeless. So this, we want to dedicate more resources for homeless prevention. And we are doing that just recently with our HAP funding, um, our HAP round four funding to dedicate more homeless prevention funds. Leveraging resources um, to expand supportive services. And supportive services is really calling attention to the housing retention, but also creating a rapport with people on the streets um, and really making sure that we're offering those resources um, while we're building those relationships, um, ultimately for placement. And um, I would just like to say um, that I'm very appreciative of the Lassar um, the Lassar contract, um, because ultimately, at some point, we'll be bringing that back to you. Um, we'll have a draft coming back to you, um, most likely by the end of June, if not July, um, for your review and consideration. So, I'll take any questions. Council, any questions for Jen? Jen, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Big hand for Jen, everybody. <laughs> For this next uh, presentation, I'm going to come around to the podium. For this presentation, I'm going to have to get in character. I would now like to welcome Justin Link, the American Public Works Association Venture Chapters President-Elect along with our Public Works Director, Cliff Finley, and Deputy Public Works Director, Nader Hadari. Hadari, thank you. To present the APWA Project of the Year Awards for recently completed city projects. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, Justin Link, for uh, the good work that you do. We're very proud of the hard work that our Public Works team continues to accomplish to make the city a better place to live. We really appreciate the recognition. Public Works will be hosting their annual open house at the city's Municipal Service Center at Newberry Park on May 23rd, May 24, to celebrate National Public Works Week. I encourage all residents to, and businesses in town to attend and learn more about the great work this team does keeping this well-maintained city. I also have a proclamation here for you, Mr. Finley. Come on up, Mr. Finley. Justin, Natter. Proclaiming the week of May 21, National Public Works Week, and I would like to invite my fellow council members. Oh, hold on. We, we'd like to make a, a Please. Like to make a few announcements. Justin, come on up, please. Right. Good evening, Mayor McAmey, members of council. Again, my name is Justin Link, City Traffic Engineer for the City of Simi Valley, uh, Planning Commissioner for the City of Thousand Oaks, as many of you all know, uh, and President-Elect for the Ventura County Chapter of the American Public Works Association. I am here on behalf of APWA Ventura County Chapter this evening. APWA is a nationwide organization comprised of over 29,000 professionals of various disciplines with the common goal of maintaining and improving infrastructure in communities across North America. Our chapter has over 350 members, 351 as of today, and is one of the most active of all 63 chapters. Each year, the chapter solicits nominations for completed or substantially complete public works projects of various disciplines that epitomize the efforts and ingenuity of public works professionals. I am pleased to announce the City of Thousand Oaks has received not one, not two, but three Project of the Year awards for the 2022 project year in the emergency repair, environmental, and transportation categories. The first award for emergency repair is the Meadows Reservoir Project. This $2.4 million emergency repair project 
featured fast track design and construction phasing starting in February 2022 and was completed in less than 11 months with minimal impact to adjacent residents. The second award for environmental is the Log Renata Pump Station project. This $6 million project included the installation of two 750 gallon per minute pumps, a 4,000 gallon per minute fire pump, a state of the art standby emergency generator, and a new 2,800 foot water line boosting fire fighting flow capacity for the immediate neighborhood. The project was completed under budget and without any water service interruption and helped save the city over 2 million in new reservoir costs. The final award for transportation is the Conejo School Road Willow Lane project. This six and a half million dollar project provides one and a half miles of new sidewalk and class two and class three bicycle lanes along Willow Lane and Conejo School Road from Hampshire Road to Hillcrest Drive. As part of the city's ongoing program to construct new sidewalks and bike lanes throughout the community, this project filled gaps in the sidewalk network on a critical link between Westlake Boulevard and Thousand Oaks Boulevard. The improvements increase pedestrian and bicycle safety and introduce traffic calming measures that improve air quality, and all of this by leveraging nearly 50% funding from federal and state grants. These projects would not have been successful without the leadership of this council and the city manager, or the expert engineering and construction management by the city's public works department led by Cliff Finley, Nader Haydari, and Shamir Shamiri. And they're hardworking, of course, project, they, of course they're hardworking project managers. It is my honor to congratulate the city on receiving these awards. Go ahead, Cliff. You want to say a few words? Just, just quickly, um, we obviously, the Public Works Department couldn't do what we do without the support of the council and the leadership of the council. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of all of Public Works. And uh, if you have a few minutes, the 23rd and 24th, please come out to public, our Public Works uh, event out at the MSC. Uh, you can get more information on that at www.toaks.org forward slash PWW, Public Works Week. Thank you. Don't, don't step Wait. away just yet. Could you tell them a little bit more about what you're gonna do at the Public Works? Water, wastewater, so forth, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so actually, um, for those not familiar, we, uh, we have a, an open house where we have invited the community to come join us for a tour uh, it's a reduced tour of kind of all the different departments that we work on in here in Public Works. Um, as it stands today, we have over 600 children coming to take that tour from, from the schools throughout the district and the valley. Um, it's a great event. Uh, we have uh, a bus ride, they go through the, the bus wash, they visit the, uh, uh, the, water, the water section, the sign yard, the stormwater exhibit. Uh, I think there's even an area where uh, they learn about ladybugs and how they are a natural, uh, natural helper in the garden. So anyway, it's a great event. Um, we, we invite anybody still who'd like to come, there's still time, uh, just go to our website. There's a number and a sign up and we'd love to have you. Thank you. Cliff, I have to say I was at a function last week and a teacher from Calabasas High announced very proudly that she had 40 of her students that will be attending that event, and they were very excited about it. With that, again, we're very proud of the work that all of you do. Thank you so much. And if you would join us out in front for a uh, photograph with our council members, that would be great. All of our, uh, all of our Public Works team, if you'll come down. Uh, come on that. down, please. You got a yellow jacket on, we want to celebrate.
And again, thank you to our public works. I, as I drive through other parts of the Southland, and as I go through potholes, I think fondly of our public works and what a great situation we have with our streets. Let's move, uh, Madam Clerk, to number nine, public comments. Madam Clerk. This is the time and place for public comments. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Three individuals have requested to speak and pursuant to council standards. Speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. Very good, thank you. First up on Zoom, we have Robert Ayers. Robert, you have three minutes, please proceed. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Can you see Can you see me? No, we can't see you, but we sure can hear you. How about now? There you go. Uh, they'll bring you in just a second. We can see you now. All right. There you are. My name is Bob Ayers. I live here in Thousand Oaks. I've spoken several times at these meetings, and it's frustrating to say it is always about the same problem, the house directly across the street from us. It is owned by drug addicts who continually break the law and have been arrested numerous times on drug charges, including fentanyl, with intent to sell, theft, mail fraud, etc. They have had their cars taken away, their dog and their cats removed, and even their daughter who is now in the system. Police are called to this house regularly and it has made my street an unsafe, unhealthy, and unhappy place to live. Our peace of mind and quality of life are gone. Right now, one of the owners is in jail, the other is out on probation, but here's the problem. The house was condemned by the city several months ago. The side and backyards are filled, completely filled with trash and debris. It is a haven for vagrants, criminals, rats, mosquitoes, from the standing water left from the rains. My wife and I moved to Thousand Oaks to be near our grandchildren, but we've spent some time, more time and energy dealing with these people than we've had with our family. Their problems have become our problems. Commander Paris and the police, they have been great, but he and the police force can only do so much. We've complained to every department in the city we can think of and also to the DA. In nearly every conversation, we are reminded of these people's rights. I'm asking you, what about my rights, my neighbor's rights, my wife's rights? What about the rights of all the other neighbors who have to put up with these criminals and now they're condemned home? Friends have asked us, why don't you move? Well, we wanted to. Uh, realtors have told us that when the buyers see the condemned sign, and all the problems we would have to disclose, it would severely impact the price of our home. So my wife and I are basically stuck in this mess and truly believe if this was one of your family's home with this home across the street, you'd figure out what to do about it. One of the times I spoke at the meeting, I was told by one of you, well, these people have constitutional property rights, but again, how about our constitutional rights and the rights of our neighbors? What about our quality of life, our peace of mind and our health? Our street is not safe and it's your job to fix it. And if you can't fix it, you ought to get another job. You know, we've called the mortgage company. We have filed numerous complaints with the mortgage company. What you guys need to do is come down here, drive down here, Get out of your cars, look at this house, walk around the house, and tell us you're not going to do something about it. You can do something about it, and we all wish you would. Or this could be your street next year. Anyway, thank you, guys. I'm sorry I'm not there, but I'm sicker than dogs. So we'll see you later. Thank you for your thoughts, Mr. Ayers. Next up, we have in person Todd Smith. Todd, if you're in the house, come on down to the podium. And after Todd, we have Karen Wilburn. Karen, come on down and have a seat behind, and we'll call you up as soon as he's concluded. Todd, you have three minutes. Please proceed. Thank you. I wish I could have submitted my traffic, my little down and dirty traffic study to Mr. Link before I arrived, but uh, that would have been really helpful. But uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to go through the basic, uh, um, the valuation, uh, some principles on the valuation of the property on the, this Borchard property issue. And um, so if I, can I, is this uh, something I can put up at all? Or? TOTV. What's that? Okay. TOTV is uh, okay. uh, up there for you. Um, just to give you an, the, uh, an idea of the impact, of the potential impact of, of not planning properly for this property. Um, just so do me do me a favor, sir. Could you speak into the microphone because oh, we, we can't hear? Okay. So if you would continue. Okay. Great. In fact, go ahead. Um, 
So um, let me get this other copy here. <clears throat> so there are basically, there are three. Um, um, let, me, let me stop you for just a moment. Uh, get settled in. Can we reset the timer for three minutes? Uh, so go ahead and get settled in. When you're ready to proceed, we'll start the timer, okay? okay Take your time. Great. <laughs> Oh, I can, actually, I can actually bring this over here a little bit. A little bit. So here's the property. Um, this is the property that we're talking about here that's um, at question here. This is the Fox Meadows property. This is the Casa, uh, the Casa Caneo property. And this is the Camino part of the property. <clears throat> um, the valuation of these homes will be affected, and here's to, to the tune of this uh, of, of this amount of these amounts. Um, the Fox Meadows here, <clears throat> there's 138 homes there. The average price of those homes, from recent valuations, prior to any big run up in the valuations, um, it, <clears throat> when you have 138 home, uh, homes at that number, um, we're talking about 130 million. Um, the Casa Caneos is 140. 143 of those <clears throat> at a at a $873,000 number average price. Um, that's 112 million. Then we have the Camino area. This area here, <clears throat> 195 homes, average list 885. That's a total of 172. That results in a in a. $415 million total valuation. Um, um, the potential devaluation, um, um, if this isn't done properly because of d various boondoggles that, that could happen from a, from a traffic standpoint, and I'm going to talk about that in a second here, but um, so what we have is a, a total of, of $415 million worth of property. If, if it's a if it's a five percent correction in those houses because of the potential lack of planning and and putting um, something in this landlocked piece of property if it if it results in a five percent reduction um, <clears throat> that that that's a total of forty one million dollars uh, divided by the four hundred and seventy six homes that, that that's comprised here that's one hundred and thirty eight in the Fox Meadows one forty three Casa. 195 Camino, that's um, 43, uh, $43,000 per home, potentially. And that goes into effect as soon as, well, uh, Carol, uh, Karen will talk about when that, when that kind of thing takes place as far as disclosure and real estate uh, sales transactions. So, so that's, a, that's a significant thing. Just to let you know, the property was purchased in 1979. Um, the Fox Meadows one is the latest one. It was they were they were um, they were um, built in '79 through '86. So the purchase the property was purchased the same time those houses were being bought were being were being built. It's sir, a business decision. Sir, it's your, a, your, your it is a business decision. I'm your, sorry. Your time has expired, but it's one where you have a great amount of detail. Yes. My suggestion would come back council meeting to continue where you are to for the next three minutes of the next council meeting. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank next you. Next up, we have Karen Wilburn, and after that, we have on Zoom Philip Blacks. Karen, you have three minutes. Good evening, I'm Karen Wilburn from Newberry Park and I'm here to talk about the unintended consequences of changing land use on the Borchard parcel when there is not a clear plan to which the owner will be bound. Both council members and the owner have acknowledged that if the land use is changed, it may be years before building starts. In 2021, one council member said the owner should have the opportunity to explore his options before presenting a plan to the city. This could have serious unintended consequences in the values of homes in the immediate area, which could last for years. Until now, this vacant parcel hasn't been an issue. When asked, realtors have been able to explain it's zoned for single, like-kind single-family homes. 
With this change, realtors and sellers will now be required to disclose the new land use or expose themselves to possible lawsuits from, from buyers. When asked what might be built there and when, the buyers will be told it's unknown, but it could be anything from apartments to hotels to breweries and could include four-story buildings. Buyers will have to ask themselves, do they want to buy a home in an area with this uncertainty of what their neighborhood might look like in five or 10 years or what the traffic impact will be? Until a, brand, a plan is brought forth and approved, these questions will remain unanswered. I have spoken with several real estate professionals who handle this area and they agree this uncertainty could have a detrimental effect on the ability to sell or the price of homes in this area. Three of these professionals have consented to including their names in support of what I'm saying this evening. You've just heard another resident monetize the combined value of the homes that could be affected. If this results in even a 5% reduction in value, then you're asking the homeowners of this area to subsidize the property owners to the tune of $20 million so that he can have the opportunity to explore his options. This is more than $40,000 per homeowner. We know that because of Sacramento's overreach, once the change is made, the city will have less control to approve or deny a project. If you disagree, I implore that you ask city staff how this could affect your control. So I summarize, these are the unintended consequences of making this change without a plan in place that the owner will be required to adhere to. Please, please do not place 476 homeowners uh, in the position of subsidizing this change. We aren't millionaires. These are our homes that we've worked hard for and they are our largest asset. I thank you very much. And I have a handout for the clerk. And thank you for your time. Thank you. The uh, Philip Black said it'll be when we hit the section regarding transitioning to district elections, I will bring it up at that time. So let's move forward. Uh, we have consent calendar. Uh, council, any um, questions? Anything you want to pull there on consent calendar? So we uh, have any speakers, Madam Clerk, on consent? Zero. Okay, so we'll move forward. Move, move the consent calendar. We have a uh, motion. Uh, to move the consent calendar. Any other questions before I uh, call for the vote? Madam Clerk. Council Member Engler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that, that item passes five to zero and I have an ordinance title to read. Ordinance approving development agreement with SJG Long Investment relating to development of property located at 88 Long Court, APN 669-0-202-260, Thousand Oaks, California, development agreement 2022-70822-DAGR, ordinance number 1714-NS. Thank you. We have moved to number 11, public hearings. City Clerk, you're on. Would you please open the public hearings? Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item 11A, transition to district elections map criteria hearing number one. Speakers are requested to state their name for the record. One individual has presented a speaker card and pursuant to council standards. Each speaker will have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Womack from city staff, we have assistant city attorney and Doug Johnson, president of the National Demographic Corporations. Welcome, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, my name is David Womack with your uh, city attorney's office. Uh, with me is uh, Douglas Johnson from uh, National Demographics. And uh, as this is our first public hearing on the transitioning towards districts, and I think at this point in time, I'm just going to hand this over to uh, Mr. Johnson. He'll run through uh, basically what we're doing, what the process is, and uh, lay this out for the public and uh, hopefully uh, encourage more public participation. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you again. Um, what we're talking about tonight is a change in how the council is elected. So when we talk about by districts and at large, that can get uh, lost sometimes. but. Currently, the council is at large, where if there are 
two seats open, two people run, three seats open, three people run, and voters get to vote for whoever they want citywide. There are a couple of jurisdictions left in the state that are what we call from district or residence districts, where you have to live in a, a certain district, but the election is still citywide. But those are somewhat disappearing uh, because the, the California Voting Rights Act, which is driving a change I'll talk about in a moment, is, treats those as just another at-large system. So that doesn't offer any defense. Oh, um, so the big trend in California is going to buy district elections, and it's driven by this California Voting Rights Act, which really pushes cities and make, um, into that election system. The law takes uh, the federal law, which has been around since 1965, and which we're very familiar with, um, and it makes it easier for plaintiffs to file challenges to cities. So under federal law, you have to fail these four different tests listed. And you have to fail all four of them before a plaintiff can force you into district elections. Under the California law, two of those tests go out. And all the plaintiff has to prove is that there's a statistical relationship between um, how what the law calls a protected class, meaning Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, or Native Americans, how one of those groups of voters vote, and how the other voters vote. If there's a difference, and the protected class voters um, have a pattern of not being elected, or not electing their preferred candidates, then you're in violation of law. Even if the voting is not racially driven, regardless of the size of protected class, um, that's how easy it is for California uh, plaintiffs to make a challenge. So they've taken the federal law, the four tests, and reduced it down to just two tests that you fail, and then uh, you're forced to change. So this law is triggering uh, what we've called a, a quiet tsunami, sweeping local governments across the state. Uh, at our last count, we were at about 275 school districts have switched, 36 community college districts, 185 cities have switched to by district elections now. And just to put that in context, before this law passed, there were only 29 by district cities in California. You know, San Francisco, Los Angeles, the big ones, and then a few federal cases. But only 29, and now 185 have, have switched since this law passed. It mentions just one county board of supervisors because the other 57 were already by district. And so the, uh, the one holdout has now been forced to change. And now we're seeing more and more activity in special districts, hospital districts, airport districts. We're seeing these legal challenges to everybody across the state. And it's not that these 500 plus jurisdictions are violating anyone's voting rights or violating anyone's civil rights. The, this huge wave is happening because of the cost involved in these lawsuits. You can see on the right-hand side um, a sampling of settlements that have been reached when lawsuits were brought where jurisdictions didn't make this initial jump before a lawsuit was filed, and they quickly get into the millions of dollars. And so far, nobody who's tried to fight one of these cases, no jurisdiction that's tried to fight one of these cases, has won. And that's part of our challenge is we don't know how high that bar is because the law is not very specific. And each time some jurisdiction tries to fight it, they end up spending millions of dollars on their defense, millions more to the plaintiffs who won the case, and, um, and everyone has lost. So that's just a little background on why this is happening, not just here in Thousand Oaks, but across the state. We did a, a little look uh, um, in Ventura and Santa Barbara County. And before this law passed, there were no by district cities in either county. And uh, with Thousand Oaks making the change, there will only be Port Wanimi and Fillmore will be the only two not by district. So you can see just locally how big this, the change has been as this uh, law's impact swept through. So there is state law in the process for making this change to avoid a lawsuit and, and change how the council is elected. So tonight is the first of two initial hearings. We don't have draft maps. These are informational, educational, and aimed at getting any initial resident input that they wish to give prior to drawing draft maps. So it'll be tonight and next week. Then um, we'll draft some maps, your residents. Hopefully we'll in engage in this process. Uh, there are a lot of tools that, uh, that I'll mention in a moment to uh, encourage them to draw maps and to empower residents to draw maps. And then we'll have the first hearing on draft maps June 20th. That likely will lead to discussion, ideas about new maps that again, residents can continue to draw and submit. 
And then July 11th will be the second uh, hearing on discussing draft maps, what people like and dislike about the different maps prior to final adoption on the 18th. There are some rules for how the maps get drawn. Uh, first of all, we have federal laws, so they have to be equal in population. And it is total population, counted roughly is counted by the census. So it's not an equal number of registered voters or an equal number of adult citizens. It's total human beings counted by the census. There's a couple of percentage plus or minus play in there, but it's very limited and that's a very tight uh, restriction. Then we have the Federal Voting Rights Act, which um, ensures that when lines are drawn, they're not drawn to dilute the voting strength of one of those protected classes I mentioned. So you can't divide up a neighborhood that's heavily populated with one of those groups because that would dilute their voting strength. But at the same time, no racial gerrymandering. So when we're drawing the maps, race can be one consideration, especially when we're looking at complying with federal law, but it cannot be what the court has called the predominant consideration. We want folks to focus on neighborhoods, not on race in drawing these maps. So those are the federal requirements. Then the state has adopted what's called the Fair Maps Act. And this sets a prioritized uh, second set of criteria. So first in the state's priority order is contiguity. The, the pieces of each district have to touch the other pieces of that district. No jumping from one part of the city to the other. Uh, to the degree possible, we want to have undivided neighborhoods and communities of interest. This does get challenging with that equal population requirement because the numbers rarely work out perfectly. But as much as possible, we want to identify neighborhoods and identify other communities of interest and keep each one of those uh, intact. Then the third uh, state criterion is easily identifiable boundaries. So you use freeways, major roads, rivers, things that people can look around and easily tell, oh, that's where the boundary is, rather than trying to uh, cut through minor roads or things like that. And the last state uh, requirement is that the districts be compact. And the state defines that as not bypassing one group of people to get to another group of people. Pretty straightforward. The state also has a prohibition, which is that the districts shall not be drawn to favor or discriminate against a political party. So in this process, we're not looking at any partisan data or anything like that because of that prohibition. And these are, of course, nonpartisan offices. So those are the two sets of uh, statutory requirements. The final column on the right is what are called other traditional districting principles. These are things that the courts have looked at and said, yes, that is something that's an acceptable consideration in the process. It's not a requirement, but it's something you can consider when drawing lines once you've met all the other criteria. And so the first of the two is uh, respecting the voters' choices, or what the courts sometimes call continuity in office. This boils down to you can look, and once you've met the other criteria, you can then try to avoid pairing current council members. And the, the court's thinking of that is, um, the voters have elected the current council members, so the degree possible, let's leave the re-election decisions up to the voters as well. If two council members get drawn in the same seat, then it doesn't matter if the voters think they both have earned re-election, one of them is not gonna be re-elected. So that's something courts have said is an allowable consideration, it's not a required consideration. Similarly, future population growth, if you know an area is gonna grow faster than another, you can slightly underpopulate it. Uh, again, we have to stay within that window of a couple of percent. Um, but you can slightly underpopulate it and justify it as based on, um, we know that area is gonna grow faster than other areas. So all the maps that'll come in will hopefully all address these concerns. Um, if, they don't, if they are not population balanced or if they raise a, a statutory concern, columns one or two, uh, we in the city attorney's office will flag that for you um, as it comes to council and goes out to the public for consideration. There's a lot of data. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all this data. Uh, it would take a long time. But I do wanna emphasize that as residents are looking at the maps or hopefully as they're drawing maps, there's quite a bit of data out there. So not just total population data, not just the citizen voting age population data, which we look at for Voting Rights Act compliance, um, but also data on languages spoken at home, um, multifamily housing versus single family housing, um, renters versus uh, owner occupied housing. All these data sets are out there for residents to consider and when each map comes in, NDC will process it and generate a spreadsheet that says all of these numbers for each district in the plan. So if someone wants to see a district that is majority renter, 
They can look through the plans that come in, check the data sheets, and they'll see how many districts in that map are majority renter, just to grab a random example. In terms of the Federal Voting Rights Act concerns I mentioned before, you can see here this is Latino CVAP, Citizens of Voting Age Population. So this is the data the courts look at as your measure of eligible voters. And you can see uh, the purple is less than 25% of these citizens of voting age in a given uh, city block or census block are Latino. As it gets up to greens, yellows, and reds, those city blocks are majority Latino. And you can see, roughly speaking, the concentrations are along the freeways. There are some individual areas separate from that, but that's the heaviest concentrations. Now you can't, there's too many people to draw a district that would have both freeways, the, uh, the length of them all in one district. But as we're drawing lines, we want to try to avoid uh, dividing up neighborhoods that are heavily Latino in particular. This is another protected class, it's Asian Americans. You can see um, we get a few where they go up from, from below 25% to 25 to 35%, but we're not really getting significant concentrations where it would drive the, the demographics of an election district. So we're not too worried about um, uh, potential Voting Rights Act concern um, involving Asian Americans in any of the maps. Same thing for African Americans. Obviously there are a significant number of African Americans in the city, but they're not geographically concentrated in a way that would drive the demographics of a district. And so we, we don't have to worry about a, a map dividing up a heavily African-American neighborhood, for example, in a way that would be illegal. So when we're looking Federal Voting Rights Act uh, concerns, we're really focusing in this city on the Latino population and not, not dividing that, those concentrations. As I mentioned, all that other data is available, uh, both as numbers that will come out for each map and as maps, so you can see um, as three examples, we have uh, household income in the top right. And again, it's the blue is lower, the red is highest. Um, children under age 18 at home in the bottom left. Uh, you can see different concentrations, but definitely a more of a concentration of families that have kids still at home in the west side than in other parts of the city. And then the renters you can see uh, in the bottom right. Again, no surprise. Uh, concentrated along the freeway corridors in particular. So those are some numbers and data. That's what we provide to this process. Uh, what we're hoping for in this hearing and, and the next hearing in particular is that uh, residents will talk about their neighborhoods. I mentioned that is number two in the California list right after contiguity. So what are people's, how do people identify their neighborhoods in particular? What are the geographic boundaries? We can't translate it into a map and say whether or not a map divides a neighborhood unless we know where those residents consider their neighborhood. And people can define it around whatever they use to define their neighborhood. It could be a park, it could be a school, it could be just between a couple of roads. And people might disagree about the boundaries of their neighborhoods. That's okay. They don't need to argue and figure out who's right. Just when we draw lines or when you evaluate maps, you'll see, did we get the whole neighborhood or maybe we just are able to get the core neighborhood? Both of those are fine uh, results. Then where it gets a little weird in districting and redistricting is what we call communities of interest. What is a community of interest? It's similar to a neighborhood, but it can be larger. Again, we're mapping, so we're trying to look for geographic areas, but we're looking for some shared uh, issue or characteristic. So a concentration of uh, people with limited English fluency could be a community of interest that obviously has an interest in, say, translation of city services. Um, folks that ha are impacted by some city policy. So if there's a part of the city that is uh, particularly hit by traffic concerns, that area could be a community of interest. Could be whatever, roughly speaking, it's whatever tells your community's story. And if you can tell us the, the, what ties your, your uh, community of interest together, that more or less makes a community of interest. But there is a second qualification that the state law has added which is, for the purposes of the state criteria, the community of interest has to benefit from being kept in a single district. At first glance, often people say, why wouldn't you be? Well, that is a benefit of concentrating the votes. It increases your ability to elect someone from your community to the council. But at the same time, it still takes a majority of the council to do anything. Some people sometimes get confused and think this is like the county where each supervisor really runs their district and makes huge decisions for their district. 
That doesn't happen in cities. Everything still comes to the council just as it does today. It still takes a majority of the council to do anything just as it does today. So sometimes a community, often a, a large retirement community, um, sometimes a, a, a downtown or other economic center, other areas can say, well, we are a community, but we would actually like to have two council districts or three council districts come through our area because that will have two or three council members that have to come to our meetings and are accountable to us, even though it reduces the odds of us electing any one. So when we hear from the community about what is your community of interest, we also want to hear, does it make sense for your community to be kept together in one seat and then you have to go out and win a, a number more votes to pass anything? Or would it actually make sense for that area to have multiple representatives? There's no right or wrong answer and it can be very different answers for different communities. But that is part of the law. Noted at the bottom here is, is one thing in the state law. A community of interest is not um, defined as a relationship to a current uh, uh, council holder or candidate or to a political party. So that those are not things that would define a community under this law. So that's a little bit of introduction to this process. We'll go over a lot of that repeatedly in the future hearings. Um, but the key thing tonight, and for getting the word out, and the city has already launched its outreach effort, which I'm happy to see, is to encourage residents to get involved and hopefully to use some of these tools. Um, I do want to emphasize that these are empowering tools. There's no need, there's no requirement to use them. If someone doesn't want to use them and just wants to come up and share their thoughts, we love that. But if people want to get hands-on and get involved, there's everything from a simple, just like a Google map screen that lets you look at the draft maps and zoom in and out and type in an address and see where that address is, to uh, some paper and online actual mapping tools where residents can draw maps. So first of all um, is the simple map viewing tool, as I mentioned, as you can see here. It's really simple. There's uh, the, on the left-hand side and the top left, you can see plus and minus to zoom in just like Google Maps. On the right-hand side are a whole bunch of checkboxes. So all the draft maps will be there so residents can look at the different draft maps. And then all that demographic data that I mentioned is all here. So people can look at that at the renters or the language spoken at home or any of that data that they wish to see. It's a really simple tool. Again, this is linked from the uh, city's project website. And this is just a simple viewer. You can't draw a map in this tool. If folks want to draw maps, but they're not comfortable on a computer or they don't have good internet access, we do have paper maps. This can either be uh, picked up from City Hall or downloaded right off the project website just as a PDF you can print at home. But these are what we call public participation kits. Um, you can see the numbers and the areas. You, people just draw a line around those little population units and they add the numbers up as they go. And the, it's right there on the sheet um, that each district should have approximately 25,427 residents. And they just add the numbers up. And then the easiest way is actually just take a photograph and email in the photograph of your map or drop it off or mail it into City Hall. However residents want to submit these maps, uh, they can do that. And then there's what's called DRA, or Dave's Redistricting App. This is an app that was launched, I don't know, 20 some years ago uh, to use as a state level gerrymandering tool. And now it's become huge. It's run by a nonprofit now. Uh, they have a staff of 15 supporting it. And just to, uh, in this redistricting cycle in 2021, they made it usable at the city and school district level. So it's a very handy, easy to use tool. Um, it lets residents draw at the precinct or even at the individual city block level. So just the same uh, fine-tuned data that I have in my you know, multi-thousand dollar software, every one of your residents now has in this online tool. And they simply use the paintbrush tool and they go in and, and uh, color it in. And we'll be demoing each one of these tools at the community workshops that are planned. So if residents want to learn more about it, um, they can, number one, check out the very short, I think it's a four minute how-to video that's on the, on the city website, or they can come to the workshop and see it in person and ask questions. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, again, the, the statutory purpose of this hearing is to hear from residents about the neighborhoods and communities of interest um, that they wish to see respected as maps are drawn. Um, and of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you or the residents have uh, as we get into this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Council, any questions? David, Mr. Newman, I should say. Thank you, Mayor. 
And thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just want to be sure I understood correctly about what is and is not considered a community of interest. Um, so two that I think may be included, please tell me uh, if they are or not. Um, one would be senior citizens, and one would be a group uh, at some, really any income level. Would, would either of those be considered communities of interest? To the degree they would be geographically concentrated, so we could identify them on a map and say, you know, here's the senior living complex, for example, and that they wanted to be kept in a single district, then yes. Um, seniors are often one that says, well, obviously they, they meet the qualifications of a community of interest, but uh, famously I had a, a group come to me and say, we turn out at 99% for our you know, off-cycle April elections. Divide us up, don't waste all our votes in one seat. So yes, they meet the qualifications, and then it's their opinion of whether they would be benef benefit for me in one seat. Provided they're geographically concentrated. Correct. Right. Okay, very good. And then I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to be sure um, that I'm clear and that the public is clear on this. Um, I think you said that that protection of incumbents is, spe is a specific non-goal of this exercise. Is that correct? Well, trying to avoid pairing them is one of those traditional criteria that's not a statutory requirement at all. But once you meet, once a map meets all the statutory criteria, then you can, it's not a, uh, it's not illegal to then say, well, I move this line one block in order to avoid pairing two council members. So it is something that's allowed, but it's not required. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Engler. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a, a curiosity question. Um, currently we have basically three governments in, in the Conejo Valley. We have our school district, our recreation parks district, and our, our city. Mm -hmm. um, is any consideration given to um, trying to match up those, those uh, borders as, as much as possible to avoid some confusion at the voting at the ballot box? Is that something that also can, can be considered? It certainly can be considered, and it is a, a common question that comes up. It's you are unusual in that there's somewhat close relationship of the border line, boundary lines. Um, often school districts and cities overlap but are completely different. Yours are different but not radically different. So they, they can be considered, You're, you are correct, that if they roughly match, then that is uh, simplifying things for the voters. At the same time, the, the um, concerns that each jurisdiction addresses are very different. So sometimes they do take a different approach to drawing the lines. Uh, for example, you know, the Rec and Parks District has a very specific mission. The Schools District has a very specific mission. The Council has a very broad mission. So sometimes those um, factors lead to different maps because we're keeping different communities of interest together. So it is something that is, is often considered, and, and you are correct, to the degree they line up, that does avoid some confusion at campaign time. Um, but they don't have to be considered, and, they, and sometimes there are very clear reasons for why they don't. So that's certainly something we'd love to hear from the public on uh, throughout this process. Question. I noticed there, Tulare Hospital had a $500,000 fee, penalty, fine, whatever. Why was Tulare Hospital involved with something that was not park schools, city government, water boards? Why were they brought into this? There was a, a wave of, of challenges to healthcare districts. And the, so Tulare Hospital has an elected healthcare board. And so they were um, sued and uh, challenged over their election system and they fought it in court for a while. Actually, they fought fairly hard. Um, and they lost and, and ended up paying $500,000. So any elected uh, body that's elected, you know, other than on a property basis uh, can be challenged under this law. Could you walk through again that we have three council members here that will come up for re-election in 2026, mm -hmm. two that will come up in 2024. Could you please go through the mechanism there on how when districts are established, how that rolls out as far as running within a certain district and moving forward with an election in 2024 or 2026? Yes, so the number of seats that come up will be the same um, by district or at large. So you'll still have three 
council seats being filled in 2026 and two council seats being filled in 2024. So that doesn't change. Um, and the, the default is, is if one current council member ends up in a seat and only one, that seat is assigned to that council member's year. Pretty straightforward. It's not statutorily required, but that's 99.99% .99 practice. Where it gets complicated is when you have two council members who end up in a seat, and those two council members are elected in different years. And then it's part of this process to decide, at the time the map is adopted, which year that seat will be up. And the scenarios get kind of uh, mind-blowing in complexity when you start running into that. Um, and of course, in that case, if there are two in one seat, that means nobody's in another seat. And so, that, uh, so the flip side of the decision on the, the shared seat would be, uh, the flip side would be what year that other seat gets elected to. So the number of council members and the number of seats selected each year doesn't change. So let's say we have a council member in 2026 in one district, but 2024, the current seated council members in that same district would they then look at the 2024 race, the one that's running in 26 would run in 24, or would they let the 2024 run, and then but then 2026 they can't run because the 2024 member's already been elected? Do you follow my question? Yes. Definitely. How is that handled? So at the time of picking the map, the council would decide which year that seat is up. And the impact of that decision is if it's chosen to be 2026, the, 20, the current 2024 member would finish the current term and next year would leave office. And then two years later could run for that seat, not as an incumbent, but just as a resident running for the seat. Very good, thank you. Yeah, if, oh, I should say, if, if it's assigned to 2024, the 2026 member can run midterm. So having been elected in 2022, could run again in 2024. If elected, you, that council member would then resign the remaining two years of their citywide seat and be sworn into the district seat, leaving a, a citywide two-year vacancy. But if they lost, they would still be able to finish the 2026. Exactly. Okay. Council members, any other questions? We're oh, good. Let's move to uh, public speakers, and we have one which was up on my screen, and I don't know how to remove that. So we had one. We Madam have Mr. Court. Philip Lax. Mr. Lax, you have uh, thank, five minutes. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead and begin. I, I uh, actually clicked the wrong button. I didn't mean to uh, speak to so just listen again. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So let's uh, move on to um, any staff responses. <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's close the public hearing and let's move to discussion. Any discussion with council members? We all good? No discussion. I think we're just uh, receiving and filing this. Um, I don't know if we need discussion right this minute. Well, it just depends if you do want to discuss. It's on my script, so that's why I'm calling for it. Uh, so let's do this. Um, it says that I have to ask for a motion here, Madam Clerk, to receive the report. Go ahead and call I would the vote. Be, I'd be happy to make that motion Oops, and sorry, find yes. that this is not a, um, a CEQA device. Staff recommendation. So are we moving forward with a, a motion here to, or a uh, vote or just uh, receive and accept? We have to vote. Vote, okay, yep. you're on. All right, uh, Council Member Engler. Yes. Council Member Newman. Yes. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. Yes. Mayor McNamee. Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, appreciate it. We'll move up to 2023 Transit Title VI Plan Update. Madam Clerk, would you please open the hearing? Hearing advertises required by law is open to consider agenda item number 11B, 2023 Transit Title VI Plan Update. There are currently no speakers. Thank you. We have a presentation by Tyler Nesvid, Assistant uh, Transit Planner. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is Tyler Nesfed. I'm the Assistant Transit Planner, and I'm joined by Mike Hauser, the Transit Program Manager. This item is for the 2023 Title VI Plan Update for Thousand Oaks Transit. 
Um, little background, the Title VI is part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, and ensures equal opportunity for all. Uh, it is required for use of federal, federal funding, which our transit program relies on. And the last update was in 2021 with a limited scope due to COVID-19. The 2023 update is a full plan and is due by June 30th this year. City hired uh, Moore and Associates who prepared our original plan and uh, the two subsequent updates. No findings were issued. Uh, but the uh, recommends expanded use of notices and postings in the three required languages. Uh, the languages are English, Spanish, and Chinese. And some examples of those posted materials would be our uh, brochure, our website postings, our social media postings. Um, the recommendation is to adopt the plan as presented and approve the resolution. With that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Council, any questions for staff? No questions for staff. Uh, Madam Clerk, I don't see any public speakers. Is that correct? Correct. Very good. S staff, uh, any comments? There we go. So with that, let me uh, close the hearing. Council, any discussion? All right. I move 11B. We got a motion for 11B. Madam Clerk. Council Member Engler. Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that item passes five to zero. Thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Next up, item 12, study session, proposed fiscal year 23-24 and fiscal year 24-25 operating budget study. We have our finance director, Jamie Boscarino, who will give her presentation. Ms. Boscarino, you're on. Good evening, Mayor McNamee, City Council members. We are here tonight to discuss the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 and fiscal year 24-25 operating budget. Featured throughout the presentation tonight are some original artwork from various members of the community that we received as part of our budget engagement outreach focused on rooted in community. The study session tonight is the third and final study session of our biennial budget process this year. We held our CIP budget study session at the April 4th City Council meeting where we presented our proposed CIP budget with almost 130 million invested over the next two years on city infrastructure improvements. User fees were adopted at the April 25th public hearing. The operating budget process was kicked off in December with a citywide budget meeting to go over the budget process and the general state of the city's finances to set the tone for departments to prepare their budget requests. Departments prepared their budgets between January and February, and then the finance budget team met with each department individually to review their budget line by line. New budget requests had to be justified. Staff then met with the finance audit committee on May 8th to review the proposed budget. Staff once again focused on budget engagement with the community through its Your City, Your Priorities budget process. There was a variety of outreach methods, including in person, on our budget website, and through social media. The goal was to help residents gain a basic understanding of the municipal budget process and get some community feedback. We had over 1,000 views on our budget website just in the past 90 days, and almost 2,000 during our entire engagement process. Staff relied heavily on social media to engage the public through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We wanted to direct the public to our budget website, provide education, and get feedback through our informal budget survey. We had a series of budget videos and received great feedback from the public. Over 11,000 accounts viewed our content on Instagram. For cultural affairs and community services, the video highlighted how the budget supports our community and cultural affairs, including facilities like our teen center and global center, grants that support sports and environmental stewardship and events like community concerts. Our library system is comprised of over 390,000 items. 
You can check out items other than books, five cool items you can check out from the Library of Things. On Thousand Oaks Transit, we've um, videoed five cool places you can visit through our transit system. And the video on our Hill Canyon treatment plant, where does your waste go when you flush? Some of the comments included that some had no idea about the park pass and the energy kits that are provided by the library. So overall, we felt that this was an effective engagement effort. Our online budget engagement survey was focused at just being a short and quick survey that the public could take in order for staff to get a high level understanding in combination with our community attitude survey of what residents' priorities are. This was a small sample size of just over 200 responses and is not a statistically valid survey like our community attitude survey is. When asked to rank the priority of city services, the highest priority of respondents was to focus on water conservation efforts, which considering the extreme drought that went on over the past summer and fall, makes sense that this rose to the top during this survey. Receiving the most votes for the city should not spend money on this service was support development of affordable housing, although it also received strong support as a high priority. Out of the list of the services above, investing in the downtown area and our CAP campus master plan was ranked at the bottom. But again, I just wanna stress this is not a statistically valid survey, it's a very small sample size. We also asked a question on services and facilities that are the most valued by our residents and corresponding themes emerged throughout that question. There was a high value placed on our open space, our park system, our libraries and bike lanes. The proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2023-24 and fiscal year 24-25 will be discussed in further detail next. Our budget theme, as I mentioned this year, was rooted in community. It's a nod to our general plan update process. As mentioned, we asked for input on what community means to everyone, and we asked for original artwork or photographs that depict their answer to this question. We received some amazing submissions as you've seen already, and like I mentioned, those are being highlighted in some of our slides. The city has a biennial budget process in what we adopt a budget every two years. As usual, staff was conservative in our revenue estimates and we took into consideration increases in the cost of doing business that we have experienced in our expenditure budget estimates. The city continues to remain fiscally strong as evidence in past actual results and on a proposed budget that incorporates strategic one-time and some ongoing investments in services and infrastructure. Our budget is structurally balanced in our general fund, which means that our ongoing operating revenues are sufficient to cover our ongoing operating expenditures. Reserves in our general fund support our CIP projects and any one-time initiatives. Just a reminder of City Council's top 10 priorities for this fiscal year, they're presented here. And we have ensured that funds have been set aside again as necessary to achieve these priorities. We have 900,000 annually in our general fund to support the operation of our planned navigation center. The county has pledged to fund half of that cost and the city and county have also jo jointly applied for a state encampment resolution grant. And if we are awarded that funding, which um, we think we have a strong application, but if we are awarded, that would actually pay for our operations for two years. We also have $9 million in funding towards water con conservation project, which we discussed in our CIP budget. We have $1.4 million and $1.3 million each year in budget for our implementation of our city's general plan. Once we adopt it, we have to update muni codes and specific plans. So we have funding set aside in the two years for that. And there's $4.5 million in our CIP carryover that we still have for any potential future affordable housing opportunities that may arise. So we have significant funding still set aside that if something were to come up over the next two years, we already have budget to be able to move quickly on that. Uh, we have budget for additional ALPR technology, the automatic license plate reader technology in our public safety category. We have significant CIP projects as we talked about at our CIP study session for environmental sustainability. And then I'll go into additional detail next, but we will have some additional staffing support that we are proposing that will help further priorities in our community development department and um, increase our public service. And then we also have 1 million in our CIP budget for continued progress on the campus master plan. 
So as I alluded to, uh, the city began reducing positions during the Great Recession, and we eventually cut over 100 positions. Staffing levels have been maintained at 381 for a decade. And although this has greatly assisted the city in being financially sound and growing our revenues and our reserves, after a strategic discussion, this proposed budget does include an addition of nine positions in the first year of the budget and seven positions in the second year of the budget for across a, a wide variety of departments and funds. And based on our long-term financial forecasting that we have done throughout this budget process, we believe that this additional staffing is fiscally sustainable in the long-term, and that's very key. We weren't gonna propose anything that we thought we could afford now, but on, not in the future. We feel that for the long-term that we can afford these additional staffing increases. We did a measured approach to staffing additions. It also allows for flexibility in order for us to implement the addition strategically and in concurrence with a sound economy. So it's not that we have 16 positions on July 1st of this year that are gonna get filled. We've really done a measured approach in moving these out over the two years and we can respond quickly to any potential downturns in the economy. One of our main goals of strategic staffing additions is to increase our efficiency and our effectiveness of our public service. That is evident in our additions in our community development department over both years. Management has presented several times here at City Council the huge increase in applications across the board that the department has witnessed and our need to supplement with contract firms in order to try and keep up with that workload. With adoption of the general plan later this year, this will only lead to a further increase in workload efforts. And also positions in our public works department and our finance department go to further our goal of infrastructure maintenance and also in tune with the increasing number of the CAP projects that we have. So our proposed fiscal year 23-24 citywide budget, this is all funds, is 266.1 million. The majority of the budget is our, in our general fund, our water fund and our wastewater fund. Those are our three largest funds. The city is required to budget appropriations and revenues in individual funds. And then for 24-25, it's 268.1 million, so just a slight increase, pretty similar in budget for each of our funds. If you look at the pro proposed budget by category, you can see the largest budget category is our maintenance and operations, which is primarily comprised of our enterprise fund budgets, water and wastewater specifically. Salaries and benefits are next with about a quarter of the citywide budget. Of course, we have to employ people in order to provide service to the public. Debt service is our smallest percentage of the citywide budget at just one million for payment of our library debt and our wastewater debt was actually fully repaid this past December. So with only one city debt issuance outstanding, the city has an extremely low debt burden. And then our proposed budget by category for 24-25 is very similar to the 23-24 fiscal year. Um, we do have an increase in transfers to other funds and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So following now is an overview of our city's major discretionary fund, our general fund. The proposed budget is considered a balanced budget. As I mentioned, balanced budget means that our ongoing operating revenues either exceed or match our ongoing operating expenditures. Although the overall expenditures in our general fund are greater than our revenues, that is primarily because of our CIP projects, which are funded through our reserves. Support from the general fund in the way of transfers out to other funds includes one and a half million in the first year and three million in the second year for our stormwater program in order to implement the mandated permit compliance costs. Our revenue in our stormwater fund is insufficient to pay for these mandated costs, and so that requires general fund support. As I previously mentioned, there's funding for implementation of the general plan. The first year has an increase also in fuel costs of about 1.3 million due to rising both unleaded gasoline costs and a huge increase in compressed natural gas costs. However, 
um, a lot of that is fully offset by the agencies that utilize our public fueling station and they pay us for the fuel that they use. So although we have an, a large increase in fuel, we also have an offsetting increase in our revenue to pay for that. We have 900,000, as I mentioned, each year for the operations for our navigation center. And again, the County of Ventura has already pledged to fund half of those costs. There's also transfer each year to our transfer transportation fund to meet fare box match requirements. These requirements were suspended during COVID and it's hoped that this suspension will continue into the future. But in case legislation is not passed that allows for that extension, we have included budget here for the transfers. And then we also included additional funding for sidewalk maintenance in order to further maintain the city sidewalks. So just in looking at past actuals and how our general fund has done over the years, our current projections um, for this fiscal year, 2022-23 are also included, and then our proposed budget for the next two years is shown. It's evident in this graph the strong financial position the city is in. The city has been able to make significant one-time investments in the community over the past several years, and we've made some strategic financial sustainability decisions as well. These past decisions have enabled the city to be in a position in this budget cycle to further our investment in the community and to mod modestly add to our positions. So our proposed general fund revenue budget for the first year, 23-24, is 109.6 million. As you can see, the majority of our revenue is from three revenue sources, our sales tax at over a third of our revenue, our property tax, and our property tax in lieu of vehicle license fee revenue. And then similar numbers for the second year of the budget, uh, a little bit higher at 111.8 million. So just diving a little deeper into our general fund proposed revenues, we do anticipate our sales tax to increase each year as our businesses continue to recover from COVID and people continue to spend. It's relatively conservative increase based on the balance between potential recession and known added businesses that we know are coming into the city over the next year. Our property tax continues to increase with assessed valuations increasing and redevelopment properties coming online, such as 299 TL Boulevard, which really increased the amount of property tax that we're receiving. Our charges for current services is projecting an increase each year with a larger increase in the first year due to development projects that are currently in progress. Our franchise fees and transit occupancy tax are expected to slightly increase each year. Licenses and permits are expected to decline the first year, but that is due to the reclassification of our business tax out of licenses and into a tax category. And then use of money is projected to decline our second year due to a tenant lease agreement that is gonna be ending. Our transfers in is projected to slightly increase each year. So overall revenue is anticipated to increase 4.4% in the first year and 2% in the second year. As mentioned, sales tax is our largest revenue source. I've shown this slide many times at presentations, but you can see how our seven and a quarter, which is the lowest that you can have, is divided out amongst different agencies. The state's general fund receives the largest share of it. Ventura County Health and Welfare receives the next largest share. The city receives about 13% of the total sales tax paid. So it's a small per portion of that sales tax paid in Thousand Oaks directly comes back to the city to be sent on, on, to be spent on city services. And then the same thing, but with our property tax, how our property tax is divided here in the city, the city actually incorporated without a general municipal property tax and we now receive a very small percentage called TEA or tax equity allocation. The bulk of property tax goes to our schools, whether it be CVUSD or state education or our community general college, um, our fire district and CRPD, CRPD also receive a share of property tax. And so after you take into account all that, only 4% comes back directly to our city's general fund to pay for services. And although this is a small share, the city actually has one of the lowest property tax rates that are around. So moving on to general fund appropriations, the proposed budget for fiscal year 23-24 is 110.4 million. 
The largest two expenditures are salaries and benefits at 38% and police services at 31%. So our people, those who are providing our services are the largest share of our general fund budget. And then proposed appropriations budget for the next year is 113.5 million. So just a slight increase from the first year. So diving deeper into our appropriations, salaries and benefits costs are proposed to increase based on the additional staffing numbers that I mentioned, as well as um, we're currently in bargaining unit negotiations, so increases for that. Our police services increases are based on contract, contract rate increases. The increase in the first year over projections is due to anticipated salary and benefit savings that police will have in 2022-23. So there, we're not expecting a 7.5% rate increase in police, but based on projections for this current year coming in under budget, it's showing up as that amount of an increase, but we won't really experience that. And then, of course, our operations increase is due to the aforementioned increases that I mentioned, such as fuel costs, navigation center, and implementation of the general plan. Our capital improvements is increasing in the first year due to the proposed CIP projects that we discussed during the CIP budget study session. And then our transfers out is decreasing in the first year due to the transfer for streets that we had this past two years in our budget, not necessary, as our gas tax revenue and TDA funds are able to pay for our street maintenance program. So more into the transfers, this is the historical support that the general fund as consistently supported other funds, including paying for our library debt, supporting library capital, supporting our stormwater program, and supporting open space. This support is proposed to continue during this budget cycle with the addition of support for transportation that I mentioned to meet our potential fare box requirements. And also we have high levels of support you can see in that blue section in the past for streets, but again, we don't need that over the next two years. So moving on to our library fund, our library fund provides the operations and maintenance for our city's two libraries and is funded primarily by property tax revenue. Our library fund proposed budget has an increase in operating expenditures from projected actuals, primarily due to salaries and benefits. Our hourly staffing is budgeted to increase in order to more adequately serve the public. Our general fund support is being proposed to pay for the capital projects that are planned. We have a, a large solar project at both libraries, as well as our library renovation, so a significant amount of capital in our library fund. So we have several other governmental funds, our lighting fund, our landscaping fund, and our stormwater fund, which I'll go over next. Our lighting fund is responsible for the maintenance and operation of our city's traffic signal, safety lighting, and our street lights. Revenue is primarily from our lighting special assessment and general ad valorem property tax. Revenue is projected to be relatively flat. We are restricted by how much our special assessment can increase annually. Our operating expenditures are projected to slightly increase in the first year due to the increases in electricity costs that we are seeing. There is budget for CIP projects in order to maintain the city's traffic signals. And although you see a deficit each year, there is adequate fund balance in our lighting fund to pay for um, these costs over the next two years. Our city's landscaping assessment district fund is responsible for the maintenance and improvement of landscaping throughout the landscaping assessment district zones. Much as the lighting fund, our landscaping fund primarily receives revenue through special assessments and um, the general ad valorem property tax. Operating expenditures are budgeted to increase due primarily to water costs rising and contract maintenance costs rising. Our landscaping fund currently has sufficient fund balance to pay for the capital improvements in year two, and the fund is structurally balanced with the operating revenue exceeding operating expenditures right now. We're putting aside funding for our capital improvements that we know are upcoming in the future. Our assessments have been set and um, we'll be coming back with a public hearing to do our assessments for both lighting and landscaping. Our stormwater fund is responsible for the operation and maintenance of the city's stormwater program and in compliance with our NPDES permit. The two revenue sources are countywide special assessment, which has not been increased by the county since 1995 as they'd have to go to a vote of the people 
And um, the other operating revenue source is sales of reclaimed water. As you can see, the general fund supports our stormwater program as our revenues are not sufficient to fund the operations in the capital. The ability to fund this program is not unique to our city. Every city across the state experiences this issue. And we're seeing abreast of grant opportunities and the statewide regulatory discussion regarding our stormwater programs. And we're hoping that the federal government and the state will step up with some funding support. Now onto our enterprise funds. These are our funds that operate like a business. They charge fees to support the operations. We have six enterprise funds, our water fund, wastewater fund, solid waste fund, transportation fund, theaters fund, and golf course fund. Our water fund is responsible for delivering water to approximately one third of the city or over 17,000 customers. Our revenue is primarily from water sales and our base charges. Staff does have a focus on sustainability of our water system long-term in reducing our reliance on imported water as we are in what it seems to be perennial drought conditions. Proposed operating revenues are increasing significantly in the first year due to an inspected increase in water usage based on the lifting of water restrictions, which leads to a corresponding increase in revenue. It is also anticipated that there will be a needed water rate increase proposed in the fall to fund the significant increase in water operating expenses. Operating expenses are primarily due to increases in salaries and benefits and the purchase of water from Cayagas. As discussed at the CIP study session, the Water Fund has many significant capital projects planned over the next two years. The Water Fund has been setting aside reserves over the past several years to fund these planned CIP projects and so we do have adequate fund balance to do so. Staff will be updating our water financial plans and developing rates and will return to fall to city council this fall. In our wastewater fund, it's responsible for the treatment of wastewater that flows through to the city's Hill Canyon wastewater treatment plant. The plant treats up to 8 million gallons per day and serves more than 37,000 residents. Our revenue is primarily from service charges. The proposed budget includes an increase in operating revenues due to anticipated rate increases to fund an increase in our operating expenses. Our proposed operating expenses are projected to increase based on increase in salaries and benefits and increases in maintenance and operations. Staff actually just received bids the other day for chemicals and we'll have to increase our budget in the public hearing that you'll see because the cost and of the bids that we received back to purchase chemicals such as chlorine was astronomically high and we have to have those chemicals in order to properly treat our wastewater. Much like the water fund, the wastewater fund has been setting aside reserves over the past several years to fund our significant plan CIP projects that we have. And we'll also be updating our wastewater financial plan, just like our water plan, and that will be returning to city council in the fall with our water. As mentioned previously, this past December, the city made its final payment on our outstanding loan. We used to have three different debt. We had two loans and lease revenue bonds, and now officially everything is paid off in our wastewater fund, and we are debt-free, which is a huge accomplishment. So onto our solid waste fund, it's responsible for a variety of programs, including our recycling program, operation of our household hazardous waste facility, sustainability efforts, our community enhancement grant program, adopt a highway. Revenues are primarily from commercial and residential solid waste management fees and grants. Our proposed budget for the solid waste fund includes slight increases to our operating revenues. Our CIP budget is for the planned food recovery storage facility, and there is adequate net, net position available to fund our CIP project in 23-24. Our transportation fund is responsible for providing bus and dial ride services in the city. In addition, the city is the designated operator for our East County Transit Alliance, as well as contracts with various other agencies to provide bus and dial ride services. Our revenues are primarily from state and federal sources. Various capital projects are proposed as part of the CIP budget and will not move forward without adequate grant funding. In addition, long-term planning is continuing about the future of transit services and countywide basis. 
Our transportation fund revenue, as I mentioned, is based on federal and state funding. Our operating expenses are primarily based on increase in the contract costs that we have with MV Transportation. Typically, our transit program is, to requi is required to meet fare box ratio requirements of 20% for bus and 10% for dial ride. But again, due to the pandemic, that was um, suspended, although we do anticipate that having to come back these next two years. So we do have budget set aside as a general fund transfer to meet our fare box requirements. So our last, or actually next to last fund, our golf course fund is responsible for our operations and maintenance of the Los Robles Greens Golf Course and Banquet Facilities and is managed through a management agreement with Arcus Golf. Golf revenue greatly increased due to the public wanting to go outdoor and do outdoor activities during COVID. Um, fiscal year 23-24 revenue is slightly lower due to the number of rounds slightly decreasing, although it is still tough to get a tee time at our golf course. Our operating expenses are expected to decrease due to a lessened use of potable water and increased use of our well water, as well as anticipated decrease in electricity costs due to the solar project that we're going to be doing at the facility. And then the final enterprise fund, our city's theaters fund, it's responsible for the operations of our 1800 seat Fred Cavley Theater and this theater that we're in is in here, um, our Jan and Ray Share Forum. The COVID pandemic did close our theaters for well over a year, but we have really seen a resurgence in performances this year, and this is projected to continue into the future. Our theaters fund revenue is proposed to increase due to the number of shows that are anticipated and the increase in rates that were recently adopted by city council as part of our user fees process. Our operating expenses are also projected to increase primarily due to increases in utilities costs. So in summary, I just want to reiterate that the proposed budget is a structurally balanced budget and it represents a fiscally sustainable spending plan for the city over the next two years while at the same time funding major CIP projects, city council priorities, and public interests such as affordable housing and homelessness. This budget presents the first increases to staffing levels in over a decade via a very measured approach targeted to increase our public service and response times, ensure adequate maintenance of our city assets such as our sidewalks. This budget presents a fiscally sustainable plan for the next two years of providing city services and infrastructure investments. Staff recommendations are to receive information on the proposed budget and to schedule a public hearing for June 6. And for um, our review and adoption of our two year budget. I want to thank our city staff. This is a lot, a lot of time and effort across the board from every single one of our departments to put this together. Um, you can imagine we have thousands and thousands of budgetary accounts that we look at individually, every single one, and um, really, really want to thank all the departments and their work on putting this together. And um, especially like to thank our deputy finance director, Carrie Matson, and our acting budget officer, Ryan Roman. And then staff are available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Boscarino. You just confirm why I am so delighted that you're in charge of this wonderful report. Also, when I go to other events where I meet other city council members and mayors, I sometimes am just so blessed that I am here with the council here in Thousand Oaks because we do not have the budget concerns that other cities do, and that's because of the fiscal responsibility that's been put on your shoulders and the way in which we handle our spending of the monies here in Thousand Oaks it provides the quality of life that we really enjoy. I'd like to, if I may, uh, open up to questions. Mr. Taylor. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation and all the hard work that went into it. I'm actually gonna piggyback off something you said. Uh, can you share the study that they did throughout the state measuring each city's financial strength and where we landed in that survey? Yeah, so. Microphone. Uh, for the past few years, every year, the state compiles information from each city's annual comprehensive financial report, and they have different risk categories, whether it be how you're doing on your pension funding, how you're doing on your retiree health funding or other post-employment benefits funding, how your reserves are, 
how your revenue is. They're looking at all these factors and doing rankings of every single city. Um, are they high risk or are they very low risk? And Thousand Oaks consistently has ranked at the top, so 400 whatever you know cities, which is a good thing. That means we are at a very, very low risk city. And um, primarily because of all the efforts that we have done towards our pension funding, you know, previous councils have dedicated 22 and a half million towards our pension. We do additional funding for our pension every single year. So our pension funding risk is a lot low. You have cities that have public safety, police, fire. It costs them a lot to provide pensions. And we've done very, very well in that area. We have strong general fund revenues, as you can see. We have very high reserves. Our, our reserves in our general fund are over 160 million. Our budget was 110 million. So our reserves can fund more than a year of our operating costs in our general fund if, in case some crisis were to happen. Um, so we're very proud of the fact that how high we rank in um, comparison with other cities. Yeah, and we're, we are blessed by it. I think it's a testimony to all the hard work. Two questions I have. One, you talked about adding new positions post uh, the, the financial crisis, and you talked about a staggered approach or, or a strategic approach in case we end up in a recession. Uh, I, I think I know the answer, but I just want to clarify uh, the approach we're taking. If we do have an economic downturn, you don't see a situation where we hire and then have to let go. This would allow us to retain the new hires we're making through any adversity we may see in the economy. Absolutely, yeah. We have nine that we're planning for this first year and then seven the second year. So we're not filling nine July 1st, like I mentioned. This will be rolled out slowly. We are constantly in the finance department paying attention to our major revenue sources, whether it be sales tax, which is you know driven by the economy. So if we do start to see signs of a slowdown, then we wouldn't necessarily fill the positions as fast. You know, we're not we're not in the business of laying off people, so we, we would take a measured approach with Great. it, depending on what's going on in the economy. Awesome. And then uh, last question, you mentioned we have $160 million in a reserve, which is paying for some of the uh, capital improvements or investments we're making. What is the, is there a standard percentage or policy that cities try to, uh, maintain in their reserves and how much do we hold and then I guess the follow-up would be even it with these investments does that put us at a risk of, of falling into a scary position which I think I know the answer but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a city council's policy is to have 20 percent reserve so 100 million you have you know 20 million in reserves as I mentioned we have 160 million in our reserves so we greatly exceed city council policy, and that's pretty standard what city governments try to shoot for is about a 20% emergency reserve in case something happens. So even if something were to happen, we obviously significantly exceed that emergency reserve. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I might piggyback on that because it's a good question from Councilmember Taylor. You know, the reason you have emergency reserves, it's an important reminder to the community at large, is in the event of a catastrophic natural disaster like an earthquake, and you would have society kind of come to a halt. The expectation is that water is going to continue to be repaired and flowed, that bridges are going to be repaired, transportation is going to be able to be returned, electricity is going to be able to be returned. So responsibility of everyone that works here will be in that disaster recovery mode and being able to fund and pay for those activities is critical. Any other questions, Mr. Taylor? No. Mr. Engler. Just one quick question, Ms. Boscarino. I neglected to ask you when we met the other day. Um, we have some money earmarked in our in our funds for um, affordable housing and that sort of uh, effort. Um, is any of that money? I think it was four point five million. Is it is any of that time sensitive money stuff that we need to uh, address quickly? No, it's actually not time sensitive. We strategically, when we purchased the Hillcrest property for the for sale affordable housing project, and also when we did our project Homekey project, we used the time sensitive funding first. We had funds set aside that we were required to spend within a certain amount of time. So we used those first. So what we still have, there's no time sensitivity. So if something comes up two years from now, those funds will still be available. Any other questions? 
I have uh, several, if I may. On the survey that was conducted, that wasn't a scientific survey, just a, sort of like a feel good, let's see what that comes back. Was any question asked regarding the public's interest of water and rainwater reuse and sustainability? No, it was only about four questions, very general. How are we doing on our services? What are your rankings of services? You know, what is most important to you? It was a very high level general type questions. All right, because we're, we've been emphasizing uh, basically conserve water and reduce your water use. And we need to move into the proactive side of sustainability of uh, what we do have. Uh, the other question, I got, again, several fees, penalties from the EPA come down every time we have a rainstorm on the east side of Thousand Oaks, where the bacteria levels go up in the creeks further downstream, and we're getting hit with fees and penalties from the EPA. What are those costs of those fees and penalties? What, what are we looking at? Are we talking thousands of dollars, millions of dollars? I'll let our public works director answer. Yes, actually, at this point in time, we are not actually being penalized. Uh, we are on, a t I believe it's a time schedule order to come up with a solution to, uh, to resolve uh, those, that things, which, which currently, one of the things we're working with is uh, the county and Las Virginies to talk about uh, possibly collecting that rainwater and reusing it, uh, creating potable water out of it through the Las Virginies Pure Water. Project, so. Previous to that, what were the fees and penalties looking like? Again, uh, I don't believe we were paying any actual fees. The, at this point, it's all been um, the request of them to, to fix the problem, not to, to pay fines. So we had a discussion. They said, uh, Las Virginia's water plant that they're developing. So good. Thank you. Next one I have for you is uh, one of the things I like about Thousand Oaks is that the business tax is low because you wanna leave money in the economy to stimulate the exchange of product and service, and we pick it up through the purchase of product and service through the sales tax that keeps us moving forward. And by having a low business tax, I think is a tremendous benefit of keeping the money in the economy instead of government taking it out and slowing down the exchange of product and service. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, is that your understanding as well with the movement of money in the economy? Yeah, um, I definitely agree that we do have a low business tax in Thousand Oaks. We want to stimulate the economy. We want to encourage businesses to come in here. We actually have businesses that are looking to look at here, and they ask us, what is your business tax? Where are we going to have to be paying? And they compare us to other cities, and we usually fa um, fare pretty favorably. So they come in saying we would like uh, the business-friendly environment of Thousand Oaks, and which brings more people to us to exchange product and service, and we pick it up through the sales tax revenue. I was speaking not too long ago at an event with uh, the other mayors uh, in the um, area, Agora, Westlake, and ourselves. And the comment I made was that I go out on Sundays to our malls to find out concerns about our constituents, our residents, any concerns about the city, and bring them back to our city manager who he addresses them. And I find oftentimes about half the people I talk to are not from Thousand Oaks. They come from Northridge, Simi Valley, Westlake, Agora, to shop. They not only enjoy our malls and our shopping centers, but also the low tax rate for sales tax. They'd rather pay seven and a quarter than some of our sister cities paying just under 10, charging just under 10% for sales tax. So that has been a boom for our economy here, our low sales tax rate, and I, I thank you for and my council members for keeping it low. Next, you talked about a 14.2% increase in salary and benefits. What is driving that increase when we've got an 8.5% increease in CPI? What's, where's 14.2% coming from? Right, so it's a combination of, and the 14.5% is looking over our projections for this year, so we have vacancies. So if you look at it over projections from this year, which is coming in significantly under budget because of vacancies compared to where we're setting the budget at, that accounts for some of that increase. Another part of the increase is because of the additional staffing that we're adding. And then the other part of the increase is proposed union negotiations and what we think will come out of that. So Very it's good. a combination of a few different factors. Okay, thank you. And last, maybe this is Mr. Finley. I, I wanna give him some exercise coming back up to the podium. I was under the impression that we process at our wastewater plant some 10 million gallons a day. Our numbers expert is telling me 8 million gallons a day. Which is it? 
Closer to eight currently. Okay, so I will now change that when I go out and speak in public, closer to eight million. Per day. We, in the past, we have done 10 million, but uh, that is a result of uh, uh, saving water and conservation throughout the city. What's the upper end capacity if it was running as, at top? Uh, 14 is the design capacity, 14 million gallons a day. Now we're adding ADUs and junior ADUs and so forth. Are we gonna get anywhere close to that maximum capacity? It, it doesn't seem as though we're ever gonna get close to that. Good to hear. Thank you, that's all the questions I have. Council members, any other questions? Very good. So what I will do then is, uh, we do not have any public speakers, correct? Okay, very good. So there will be no staff responses, is that a safe assumption? Okay. So I ask for the um, motion, Mr. Adam. Well, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Jamie and staff. I know this takes a long time to put together an operating budget of 260 odd million dollars. Appreciate that. And thank you for taking into consideration the public comments. I think you addressed affordable housing, uh, water conservation, homelessness, public safety. It's all in there, so that was great. And uh, just some of the highlights that stood out to me is number one, we're virtually a debt-free city. Uh, we owe almost zero, and that's rare for a city of our size. Um, happy to see that after COVID, uh, the theaters you know, were under a lot of pressure, and we're at the point now where we're almost break even with the theaters. And Jonathan, I think, mentioned to me that we're booked to the middle of next year. So that's a great big improvement. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we've been known for our public safety here in the city. Uh, we're always rated up in the top cities in the, in the state, and, and that's why we spend a third of our uh, general fund budget on public safety. So thank you, for Jeremy, for making us a safe city. And I think it's money wisely spent. And uh, as far as pension costs, you know, we, a while back we decided to basically refi our pension debt from 30 years down to 15 years, save the taxpayer 15 million bucks by doing that. And we have a pension stabilization fund that we started with 22 million, I think. It's up to 28 million now. So, and that's just in four years. So that, that's a big highlight for me too. And as the mayor said, you know, we're a low tax city. Uh, we don't impose a property tax on anybody. We haven't since the city was incorporated. We're seven and a quarter percent on sales tax, uh, and and what we get for that is forty percent of our general fund is sales tax. That's why the Greater Canal Valley Chamber of Commerce is so important because we rely on you to support our businesses and to help us grow them. So, thank you for that, Danielle. And um, finally. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased with the way you, this has been put together. And uh, I, I know we have to, this is a study session, so I'll, I'll move that we um, accept the study and uh, we'll go on to approve the budget in June, I believe, correct? Thank you, Mr. Engler. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, um, I'll, I'll jump on the bandwagon of nice job. It takes a, a lot of work to, to uh, designate where all this money is going and keeping track of it all. And thank you and your staff for doing that and also the staff in general for being part of that uh, process. Um, the one thing that I, I um, wanted to remind everybody that we are adding a couple of, well, what, nine people this year and a few people the next year. Um, we uh, trimmed our, 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 our people by almost a, well over 100 people about 10 years ago and have stayed at that level all these years uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, there's been a lot of things added to the plate in the past 10 years. Um, code compliance, uh, this, this uh, wastewater or, or uh, stormwater uh, issue that has now come to us, that takes people to manage. Um, so, the thing that I noticed, though, is that the people we're adding are just about all uh, public-facing people, uh, people in our community development department who are gonna be able to do our plan checks quicker and more efficiently. Uh, people in, uh, in public works that we have just had public works day to day who um, do keep our roads nice and straight and, and do all the things that make this city function uh, seamlessly, um, there's there's nothing like uh, knowing that uh, 
uh, the waste treatment plant is going to work when you need it. Uh, that, that happens without a thought by most of our citizens, and that's not an accident. So I'm glad to see that our public-facing people are gonna enhance that so that we can um, continue that good service that, we, that people expect and that uh, we're proud of. Um, and I think uh, I would support the, the motion uh, to accept the, the, uh, uh, the information and look forward to you coming back in June. Thank you. Mr. Newman. Thank you. I want to echo the, the kudos that others, others have given, um, certainly to finance, to, to you and your staff. Um, who have done a wonderful job of clearly explaining a complex topic, the, the budget, a two-year budget, and, and as well, to, really, to all city staff uh, who worked with you. This is a collaborative process. I'm especially pleased about the community theme of this and, first and foremost, the community input that went into this. This is a collaborative, cooperative process. And... Although the survey you did is not statistically valid, it is, its findings are very much in line with other surveys that our city has done. And, and this is a budget that identifies and addresses priorities that our residents are asking for. There's money for homelessness, for addressing homelessness. There's money for public safety, for keeping our city one of the safest. And one of the, one of the things you know, we all agree we're incredibly lucky to live in such a beautiful place, and, and we are. This is a great place. And there are things about that that we can see and touch. You know, our, 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 we have great open space. We have first-rate libraries. We have great schools. We have really good streets, um, all that, good, good public services. Um, a financial process is not something you see. But, but good fiscal management and fiscal responsibility is just as important to this being a wonderful place as any of the things that we can see or touch. And I, I commend you for your good stewardship in that area. And that, that's why I'm, I'm pleased to support this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newman. I, I would like to uh, dovetail on Mr. Adams' uh, comments in that I treat my private practice, police and fire, on a frequent basis and hear comments about what crime is taking place in our community, but more importantly, the tone and tenor of what is occurring within each of the departments. And I can tell you that listening to other agencies, law enforcement and fire, that we are very, very blessed that our police, who are part of Ventura County Sheriff's, have a wonderful rapport with the people here in Thousand Oaks. The people here of Thousand Oaks respect our law enforcement, are active in our community to inform the police of crime taking place. But the second step on that is our police are responsive in a courteous but enforcement way. And because of that, we have a wonderful community that is considered safe by any standards when you look around the Southland. And again, I applaud my hats off to you, Chief Paris and our Sheriff Jim Fryoff for setting that tone for our law enforcement and thanks to our citizens who support our law enforcement and point out crimes that take place and the responsiveness of our police to address it really puts us head and shoulders among other agencies as well as other cities regarding crime. So thank you, sir. With that, uh, I would like to, uh, again, we don't have any other discussion. We've got a motion on the floor. So uh, Madam, may we uh, call the roll? I just wanna make sure that the motion includes all three recommendations to receive the budget information. Mr. Adam, you wanna read that out again? This, just staff recommendations? Mr. Adam, you wanna re restate? Yeah, I'm mo uh, moving uh, 12A, the uh, accepting the uh, proposed operating budget study session. 12A, one, two, and three, correct? Yes, sir. Madam Clerk. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Engler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you. We are gonna talk 16A, League of California Cities Leaders uh, Summit, April 12th to 24th. The report I'm gonna share with you, uh, 
California League of Cities is where all the cities in California come together as a united voice to deal with legislation in Sacramento to have our voices heard from the city side. And I have to say our Washington group who went to Washington to lobby on grant money for a wonderful city, we took the show on the road April uh, for um, uh, Sacramento. So Council Member Engler and Newman and I, I think we've got our shtick down, do we not? We did well. So we attended the Cal Cities Summit in April, and that's where we, cut, again, had a lot of meetings with our representatives while we were there for that summit. We met with Jackie Irwin, our assembly member, and her staff. Uh, we met with legislative directors for Senator Stern's office and Al Mirachi, and we discussed legislative bills sponsored by each office, including AB 1035, which deals with rent control for mobile homes. Now, the city does not control the rent for our mobile home parks. The state controls the mobile home parks through rent control. They establish it. So the city has no control over it, but we were lobbying on behalf of our mobile home renters for the um, bill that was being put through to control mobile home uh, rent control. AB 1708 amends Prop 47 on theft. We are not the only city who is being hit with these snatch and grabs that some cities are complaining that they're losing some major chains in their cities for revenue. Result is that they have had to close down some of their businesses in other cities. Loss of jobs, loss of rent, loss of sales tax revenue to run the city. So Prop 47 was a consensus that it needs to be amended and or turned over, but that's the challenge of Cal Cities as to how to address this and again, one of the things discussed was Jackie Irwin, our assembly member. She had uh, a wonderful, wonderful piece of legislation that ended two years ago that the uh, Prop 47 changed the misdemeanor to a felony, it used to be at $400 worth of theft. Now it was moved under Prop 47 to 950. So criminals were going in and taking things under 950, which was still a misdemeanor, which is essentially a traffic ticket. Businesses weren't even reporting it simply because it wasn't worth the effort to take someone off the floor, fill out a police report, and nothing's going to happen. So Assemblymember Irwin put through a brilliant bill several years ago that said it was cumulative, that when you steal something, that adds to the total of 950. Well, that expired two years ago, if I remember correctly. And she brought it back last year and didn't get out of committee it was there this year, and I don't know if it got out of committee or not, but something to that effect. And that's something that we need, so at least it gives some teeth that the, felon, the misdemeanors can now be brought into felonies. We lobbied on behalf of AB 1637, proposal for government agencies to transition to .gov, and our city is already ahead of that. We are on our way to doing that. SB 717, diversion program for criminals with mental health issues. This again gives the ability for law enforcement to say you've got two choices. You can either go to uh, mental health uh, programs or go to county jail and that gives them a little more effort to uh, get them uh, treatment. City used that time to express concerns over a number of housing bills introduced and update each member on what's happening in their city and that Sacramento is usurping control of our cities by telling us how to run our city and our housing element and what may work for Los Angeles doesn't work for Thousand Oaks, and it may not work for a city of 1,500 people. So Sacramento, in my opinion, as I said with the other council members, as well as many, many, many of the other council members at this meeting, said that this is not a good thing for Sacramento to tell us how to run our housing element within our own city. We can do it our best. City Leaders Summit, uh, we were at various educational summits. We uh, top priorities for the Cal City's leaders were protect and expand investment to prevent the re, uh, and reduce homelessness. Number two, increase the supply and affordability of housing while retaining local division uh, decision making. Three, improve public safety in California communities. Four, safeguard essential local revenues and support fiscal sustainability. Uh, specific budgetary asked was Cal City's is to request three billion in continued funding for affordable housing and homeless programs for local governments. I have to say our delegation participated in a number of breakout sessions from communication skills for leaders, future of home key motel conversions, best practices for illegal dumping, surplus land act, universal inclusion in your housing, and how to fight crime 
with civil litigation. I have to say that I was just very impressed with how Councilman Newman and Councilmember Engler and I were able to communicate the needs of Thousand Oaks and hopefully uh, make some changes there in Sacramento to help these bills get through. If, if I may digress here for a moment, Councilmember Engler, is there anything you want to comment on Cal Cities at this point? We'll come back to uh, the other one, but anything on Cal Cities? No, no not, not for the leadership um, conference. It was, it was uh, as you said, it was, you've covered pretty much everything we worked on. It's an opportunity for us uh, on the council and staff to, uh, to get direct input to some of the um, decision makers up in Sacramento. Um, and we voice strongly some of the things that you've mentioned, Mr. Mayor, uh, and hopefully uh, we, we have some receptive ears up there. Mr. Newman. I wanna echo all that's been said. That's a very comprehensive report. Um, and I concur with Council Member Engler about the importance of going face to face. It's, it's good to have phone calls and Zoom calls and all that, but this virtual stuff only goes so far. You have to be there in the room. And I especially want to uh, call out the, the expert work of our legislative affairs uh, uh, person on staff, uh, Ms. Mina Leba. Um, who knows the players, she knows the issues inside out. Um, anyone who's interested what we're doing on these, these trips, either to Washington or Sacramento or wherever, um, these are not junkets. The, these are substantial fact-finding and fund-finding trips to, for the betterment of all residents here. And anyone who wants to know more about them, I, I encourage you to read. Uh, Mina's report, which is part of uh, tonight's agenda. So very well done. Thank you for acknowledging uh, Mina Leba's uh, efforts here because without her, we would not have the success in Sacramento and Washington that we do. Uh, it takes a lot of work and it's usually 12, 13, 14 hour days, but uh, it's very rewarding and I think we did a very good job, council members. I think we did well. Uh, with that, we have a, any, I'm asking for a motion on uh, 16A, one and two, anyone? Mr. Adam, Madam Clerk. Council Member Engler. Yes. Council Member Newman. Yes. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. Yes. And Mayor McNamee. Yes. And the motions pass 5-0. 16B, League of California Cities Channel Counties Division Meeting. I was unable to attend, but I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Engler if you would do a report, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was a good, uh, good event. I'm sorry you weren't able to be there. Um, myself and Council Member Taylor uh, attended this, uh, this event. This is another in a series of opportunities for us to uh, meet face to face with cities in our general area. This is Channel, uh, Channel uh, Counties Division. So it's, it's the beachfront properties uh, all along from Ventura to Monterey. Uh, we have a lot of things in common and it's good to see these folks and compare notes. Um, one of the nice things about these particular conferences is that it was this particular conference was held in, in San Luis Obispo, and the folks there were able to highlight some of the things that they are doing uh, as an example of, of activities that other cities could emulate. Um, in particular, they have a, a pretty robust series of um, murals and public art that is growing throughout uh, their downtown area. And uh, they, were, they were able to highlight all that for us in a special tour. Um, they are becoming known in the art world as a destination to come and see some of the uh, notable murals that have been put in, as well as parks with art, uh, parquets. Uh, there was one that was a former gas station that the city uh, inherited, and they turned that into a small parquet with art, uh, you know, fixed art in the area. It's something that they are doing to try to enrich their downtown and make it more of an experiential shopping area. Um, the other, the other thing we did was we uh, took a um, uh, another walk throughout their their downtown, and they talked about the different projects that are going on to help breathe vitality into the area 
it was very reminiscent for me to think about what we are attempting to do along our boulevard in bringing uh, some housing onto the boulevard to give some vitality to our shopping district along the boulevard. Um, it was a, it was a, I took some good notes. I'll be sharing them with some of my council uh, uh, colleagues. Um, they are doing several of the things that we are attempting to do for our own city. Um, along with that, um, we had a uh, quite quite an experience with um, the. You know, we we stayed at the Madonna Inn, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Council Member Taylor for his uh, his thoughts on the actual uh, dinner that we had there at the Madonna Inn. Uh, so what was nice is I invited my wife. We had Grandma and Grandpa watch the kids and got to spend time with Bob and Sue, which was uh, much needed for us and, and really enjoyable. Uh, so everyone around, you know, each city has a table and everybody was going around introducing themselves and, you know, it turned into banter about who produced the best strawberries. And it was, it was just, it was funny and it was nice to meet everyone. Uh, the other thing, my wife and I, the next day spent time in uh, San Inez in Los Alamos. And even prior to that, we went to uh, uh, lunch in San Luis Obispo. And really quick, me, quickly, my wife grabs my phone. She goes, I'm gonna text Drew. And she's taking all these photos and sending them to Drew. Like, Drew, can we do this? Can we do that? So it was, it was cool and uh, I agree with what Bob said. Some of the things that happened the night of the dinner, uh, the new division chair, Mayor Erica Stewart from the city of San Luis Obispo was sworn in. There's a keynote speaker, the new, newly elected assembly member, Don uh, Ades from Morro Bay. She was a phenomenal speaker. We are engaged the whole time, which was really cool. She was talking about some of the bills that she's sponsoring, uh, including housing for community college students and support for low-income seniors to gain access to the senior care facilities. And then the other thing that, that uh, Bob kind of mentioned about the coastal communities, uh, they created a caucus to provide representation for the five counties along the coastal region of the US 101. Uh, the vice chair, Senator Monique Limon from Santa Barbara. So it was uh, all in all, uh, it was really cool to hear everything going on. It was nice to have some time just with my wife and being able to share things going on with the city with her. So really, really cool event. It was uh, great to attend. So we were at the Madonna Inn you have a themed room, which one were you put in? Oh, that's a good question. I don't even remember the room I were in, but I'll digress really quick. We finished the dinner maybe like around 10, and the pool was open till 11. So my wife looks at me, she's like, you wanna go to the pool? I'm like, okay. And it's often in the corner, it's quiet, so we thought we were gonna like just you know enjoy some quiet. We get there, and there's probably 40, 50, uh, you know, between 20 and 25 year olds in the pool. And very quickly we walked in like, wow, we're like mom and dad here. We felt like, you know, we stuck out, but it was, it was fun. Bob? Th there's, there's opportunities to um, uh, interact with folks, which is very, very good. Um, my, my particular room was very memorable. It was the Portugal room. Uh, it was straight out of 1963. It was very nice. Um, the uh, the real benefit to these things is uh, we were able to, um, as as Councilman Taylor talks about at the dinner, we were um, talking back and forth uh, with other people. So uh, there's a it's called the social hour, but it's really uh, we have the ability to talk to folks. A, on a personal basis about how things are going in their city. Uh, very valuable, I spent quite a bit of time with a couple of council members from Ventura talking about some of the shared issues that we have. Um, it just makes a big difference uh, in how we can uh, approach things in the future. Um, my, my, I, I did offer to um, council member Taylor uh, if he and his wife would like to go out uh, after dinner and uh, then my, my, after my wife kicked me in the shin uh, and mentioned that um, they don't have the kids tonight. <laughs> and um, we, um, I, I came to my senses and uh, let him go on his own. Good man that you are. With that, I'd like to um, ask for a motion for uh, 16B, one, receive the port, two, not affected by CEQA. Before I do that though, 
I, I really, really, really ex um, am grateful we have the quality staff we have here. City Attorney reminded me just to make it real clear to everybody that at no time while we were lobbying in Sacramento did we have more than two council members there in front of a legislator so we would not violate the Brown Act. So thank you, I appreciate you keeping us on track. With that, uh, motion for 16B, one and two. So moved. Mr. Adam, Madam Clerk. Council Member Engler. Yes. Council Member Newman. Yes. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. Yes. And Mayor McNamee. Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. I'd like to turn it over to City Manager Drew Powers to uh, talk about upcoming issues and announcements. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor McNamee. Just very briefly, we'll be back next week, as mentioned earlier. Um, aside from a couple special presentations, uh, the uh, only item we'll have is uh, our second uh, public hearing, as uh, outlined in the process of um, shifting to district elections. So it'll be, uh, a, be a bit of a repeat of uh, this evening, but another opportunity to have that public hearing. And that'll be next Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. Thank you. We will adjourn this evening in the memory of Cindy Pedersen. Um, we're, we're again adjourning in her memory as a distinguished community member. She passed away April 10. A native of Rockwell, Texas, Cindy spent her high school years in Northridge and moved to Thousand Oaks in the late 1980s to raise her family. Cindy was hired by the city of Thousand Oaks as a crossing guard in 2015 and was assigned to the Sequoia Middle School. Cindy was promoted to senior crossing guard two years later where she was responsible for the safety and training of 30 crossing guards assigned throughout our, the community. Known for her attention to detail and commitment to safety, Cindy continually improved the program to ensure it was the finest of its kind. Her approach to ensuring the safety of residents in crosswalks resulted in an impressive achievement under her stewardship. As one of city, st city staff said, she just wasn't a leader. She was a crossing guard at the core and working tirelessly in the withering heat, pouring rain, and high winds because of her real love for children in this community. Cindy was appreciated for her kindness and gentle nature and her ability to get along with everyone. Cindy loved to create holiday decorations. She raised, raised orchids and gave them as gifts in hand-crafted decorated vases. Flowers that Cindy planted in Sequoia Middle School continue to thrive. We cannot adequately thank Cindy for her commitment to residents of this community, and we mourn her passing with her family, coworkers, students, parents, and friends. Cindy will be greatly missed. And with that, we adjourn to next week.